for joining us today. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Romero. Dr. Romero dropped out of high school and was passionate about cars and lowriders. He subsequently decided to take some auto classes at Mount San Antonio College and had to take a biology class and fell in love with biology and science after taking the course. After completing his AS in biology and engineering, he transferred to UC Irvine and completed his bachelor's degree in biological sciences. He attended medical school at the University of California, Davis, and completed his residency and chief resident in general surgery at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. Following his residency, Dr. Romero completed a fellowship at LA County USC in trauma and surgical critical care. He is certified through the American Board of Surgery and General Surgery and Surgical Critical Care. Dr. Romero is currently the Director and Chair of Surgery um, Services for Ventura County Medical Center and General Surgery Residency Program Director at Community Memorial Hospital. Dr. Romero still loves to work on cars and is passionate about taking care of his community, teaching and training the next generation of surgeons. Welcome, Dr. Romero. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, I want to congratulate you for your pre-med CC organization. I think it's a fantastic organization that really is proactive on things. Um, today, I just wanted to actually open up the floor for anyone that has a question and really actually have this as a uh, dialogue and a conversation for anyone that has any questions for me on the journey that I've had, uh, being a physician, uh, being a uh, surgeon, being a trauma surgeon and perhaps um, a surgical educator. So I'll open the floor up for any questions that any may, anybody may have. So I have one question. What led you to change your mind about medicine um, why, why did you why did you decide to go into medicine while you were at community college? Or is that where your trajectory was? Right. So in community college, I really came into community college more to get a fundamental general education. And I think a community college is a fantastic way to do that. Um, as uh, as Veronica was saying, I did not um, graduate from high school and I dropped out. And so in the interim, I did various jobs from cleaning carpets to painting houses to working on cars um, and uh, to bartending and to uh, waiting tables. And during that uh, uh, time when I was waiting tables, I was talking to a, a uh, couple about just life. And they mentioned about stocks and bonds and bear and bull markets. And I was a hustler and I just wanted to make sure what I what was that all about. So I asked my buddy who was a bartender, Scott, Scott Newman, still I still remember his name. I said, what's a bear and bull market? And he looks at me, he goes, dude, you're stupid. And I said, you're right. I don't know what's going on with life with bear and bull market. I should know that kind of stuff. So I signed up for junior college thereafter just to get a fundamental education on the uh, current events. And, uh, you know, I started taking more classes, more classes. I took some auto body classes. I took some air conditioning classes, basic science. And then I went into, I was curious about biology and I started my prerequisites for the nursing program, um, which was really fun. I really liked math and I liked biology. And I had a, a teacher in my general chemistry class which I did really well on. And he just said, what do you want to do when you get, you know, done here? I said, I want to, you know, maybe do some nursing. And he goes, maybe you should think about uh, giving orders instead of taking orders. And I'm like, ooh, I like that. And so he directed me towards pre-med and I started taking pre-med courses. And I went to uh, transfer to UC uh, Irvine um, and I got my biology degree there and also did some research as a Howard Hughes uh, fellow. Um, and there was a lot of opportunities, a lot of people that really took a chance on me and uh, was, uh, uh, was very exciting. Uh, I was just really curious. And 
that's my one of my my pearls, if you will, from this talk that we're going to have is do something that you like, because if you don't like it, you're not going to be really good at it. If you like it, stick with it. And it could be anything it could be art, music, uh, uh, politics, philosophy, uh, contemporary uh, architecture, whatever the case may be, but follow your heart and, and that'll get you where you need to go. And it's not about the end results. It's really about the journey and have fun doing it is really the important things about college. College was really developed to really learn about life, to learn about yourself as well too. And uh, that's what how my journey started with the junior college and uh, uh, college thereafter. I hope that answers your questions. Dr. Romero, other than your um, professor um, suggesting it, um, what actually led you to decide like why medicine? Right, um, I like helping people and I like putting puzzles together, including cars. Cars are just big puzzles. And so I went from body works to offender to body work. I'm a trauma surgeon. So if there's a gunshot wound or, or a car crash, I put stuff back together or I stop the bleeding. And it really isn't that much different. And so I just put together what I really like to do, which is puzzles, because I also do ICU stuff. I'm an intensivist, surgical intensivist. And, and that's my approach. It's pragmatic. And uh, um, um, I like putting things together and I like solving puzzles. Any other questions? Another question was, who are some of your mentors when transferring from community college to university? Yeah, a great question. Um, there was a counselor, I believe his name is Mr. Green, who at first was trying to steer me towards air conditioning and welding and as a vocation, which, you know, would have been great. But the more I went to visit him, the more I really got uh, advice on pursuing my curiosity more than a, a trade. And so he's one of them. The other one is Mr. Reif Snyder, Dr. Reif Snyder, who was that general chemistry uh, teacher. Um, I did karate with one of his son. I, I'm a martial, I did a lot of martial arts when I was growing up. And so I had that connection and he was very supportive for me. And then my karate instructor um, was very supportive of me continuing my education. And of course, my parents and my family and my brothers and sisters. Um, another question, what do you think was your biggest struggle while in school and what did you do to combat those struggles? So I think it's, I think it's how you learn. You have to, there's a, there's a saying, know thyself, and it's on the temple of Delphi in Greece, and it's uh, the, the temple of Apollo, which is in Delphi in Greece, and in the top of the temple, it says, know thyself, and, and what, what I mean by that is that by knowing thyself, you know your strengths, and you know your weaknesses, and I think being honest with yourself and saying, I'm not a really good studier. How can I improve and really focusing on some of the things that you can improve on? So I was really bad at, uh, at memorizing things. So I had to go through the process of figuring out what makes me a better student. How do I capture that knowledge and regurgitate it? Because that's what it is at first in, in college, as you guys know, you're regurgitating some information and bringing it down. So I made a game out of it. So I put history behind it. I used mnemonics. I made little poems. I used flashcards. I had this big chalkboard before the whiteboard. I used to write shit down in this big thing so I could memorize it. I would get up and look at it again before I went to work. Oh, and, and that, that helped me out quite a bit. So my biggest struggle was to figure out how I learned. Now I'll repeat that. Sometimes the biggest struggle is figuring out how you learn. And that may not be the same at all time. So some folks learn by listening to it. Some folks learn by looking at it. Some folks learn by writing it all down or some folks do the highlighting thing. And then all of a sudden your textbooks look like a rainbow and everything is highlighted and 
you know, it's you have little notepads and stuff like that. So figure out a figure out a process that works for you and 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 be OK with failure. And I want to repeat that. Be OK with failure. And the reason why you have to be OK with failure, because part of life is not doing well sometimes. And there's a saying that goes. There's two ways you go. You shouldn't see it as failure. Either you either succeed at something or you learn. There really is no failure. And and if let's just say you don't do well on the test, well, you learn something. You learn that you don't know that material, and you go back and actually try to master that material again. And so it's it's okay. And be courageous enough to take classes that really push push you a little bit. And it could be a calculus. It could be a really hard trig, or it could be an advanced English class when you don't think you can write really well and you don't have that courage to do it. Just go for it. There's only one way to find out and do it and use your resources. Use your resources. Uh, a couple of people have asked, did you always know you wanted to do surgery or did you discover no. your specialty interest? No. In med yeah, school? the surgery came in really late in medical school, actually. I was going to be a family medicine doc. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had the whole thing figured out. I was going to work in a clinic. I had my residency worked out and stuff. And then there was a, there was a, I think I was a third year. Yeah, third year re medical student at uh, University of California, Davis. And uh she came in for um, a checkup and she had some abdominal pain and she looked really pale. And I did this test on her called a tilt test and she had pain in her left shoulder. And I just learned about that. And that means that there's fluid in the abdomen or there's blood in the abdomen. And I did a pregnancy test on her and she had an ectopic pregnancy where the baby's in the, in the uh, fallopian tubes and it ruptures. And then I called the surgeon who was on call, which was right next to the hospital. The clinic which was right next to the hospital he was a general surgeon and we took her i i helped took her to the operating room and you know fixed the bleeding and uh, she did well and i just said man this is good so that was it that was the aha uh -huh moment if you will where i just said that this is where i belong so you don't have to know before medical school what you want to oh be no and i yeah and i i, I think usually you should go in with the medical school with an open mind because you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. You're going to say, oh, I like that shit right there. That's me. And then a week later, you're like, that's not me. This is me. And you're going to actually have a lot of changes. And it's and that's OK, though. Um, it's going to be like, a, you know, when you're really hungry and you go like to buffet and stuff and you're just hungrier and you just you just go for it. And your plate's really full. And then you're, you're thinking I didn't really like those ribs to begin with. It's kind of like that in medical school. Um, we were also wondering, are you the only one in your family in medicine? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm the family doc. So anytime that if somebody has a rash, I get these funky ass pictures on my phone. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not what I do. <laughs> go, go, go see your doctor. That's my, yes. So yeah, right now I am. My brother still owns a body shop in Costa Mesa and my sister helps run a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, marijuana dispensary actually with my with my nephew in Santana and my older brother is a machinist he, and he looks almost exactly like George Lopez <laughs> but but if they get in a car accident they should call you right yes they do yes they will any other questions Another person was asking about any extracurricular activities you did uh, during your undergrad. Yeah, and as an undergrad, my extracurricular activity was go get my ass to work and get a paycheck so I can pay for college. So I know there's a lot of emphasis on that, but I think for most of us here on this on this on this podcast that uh, we have to work for a living. And so I worked you know, pretty much full time when I went to college and stuff. So my extracurricular activity was paying the bills. Kind of piggy, picking off of that question, um, since you had to work, uh, was it hard um, for you during your pre-med track? 
So the answer to that is, I don't know, because that was it. That I didn't have anything to compare it to, you know what I mean? So that was that was just the norm for me. Um, and, and again, I had a lot of support from my, my brothers and my parents and all that stuff, moral support. Um, and so it's, that was just the norm, um, that you had to work and you had to get good grades and, uh, you just had to do time management and there's sacrifices. And so instead of going to all the quinceañeras and going out with the homies and relaxing on Sunday afternoon, drinking beers and stuff, you test say maybe one beer, and then I got to go study, or I'm not going to go to that dance, or, you know, I can't, I can't make it tonight, or I won't be able to go to that barbecue. And those are the, those are the, the things that sacrifices you make to, to get over, you know, the, the, uh, that hump, if you will. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's okay, some folks don't have that luxury, they have to work to pay the food in their stomach and roof over their head, and yeah. Pay for books and so that's the reality for a lot of folks so yeah and and i and that was the reality for me because sometimes you know i had to work on the weekends i had to wait tables or where to you know clean some carpet or detail a car or something but it but the the the, the reality is that that is a norm for all of most of us and uh there are some resources out there like tutors and uh sharing notes with your with your classmates and sharing books. That was a big thing for us when I was in junior college is I didn't buy new books, I bought used books because the new books were like twice as much. Um, I think it's a little different now because everything's online, but there's there's ways to just kind of navigate the system where it doesn't have to hurt you so much to go to college. Now, most of you go to the California colleges or this na uh, this nationwide? Yeah, we have some people from Illinois, Louisiana, yeah, uh, Phil, uh, Pennsylvania. So, but but I would say probably seventy five percent are from California. Yeah, I think that the community college system is the best deal that California has. Speaking of which, because at at the at the end of the day, if you do two years at a junior college, you can transfer to Cal State or UC, and you're in good shape. Um, and um, I sit on some admissions committees, and we like to see that grit. You know, we call it grit or ganas, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that, to me, shows dedication and also longevity. And so I think it's value added when I see that in the application, because I, I also sit on the admissions committee for the surgical residency program. That's when they're people are applying to become surgeons. And I, I, and I think having that background really shows a lot of uh, uh, dedication. We have someone from Texas that was really upset that we didn't identify, so. Say that again? So we have somebody from Texas that wanted to make sure we said that they're from, we have people from Texas too. Okay, they were Texas. upset that. <laughs> we don't judge here. We love Texas. Uh, another person was asking, what type of work uh, did you do during undergrad? And I think another important thing to highlight would be, do um, admissions committees value activities that are paid versus unpaid? Uh, Great question. Equally? That's a fantastic question. So it really depends on where you're applying to. Some schools really put an emphasis on extracurricular activity that are non-paid. Um, so you have to do your research on what school you really want to go to. What's the philosophy of the school? And if, if it aligns with your philosophy, and that's really, really important. That's research that you have to do before that. Um, what I did in the, as an undergraduate is that I was uh, a waiter. Uh, I attended bar, uh, worked at a body shop, uh, painted houses, cleaned carpets. What else did I do? I, whatever it took. Uh, I was working for construction. I was a gopher. You guys know what a gopher is? Explain to them. It's uh, you, you go for that and you go for this when someone tells you what to do. So basically you're telling your, your people are telling you what to do all day long. So you're just a gopher guy, go for a coffee, go for that hammer, go for that lumber. So I was a gopher guy for, for a long time for a construction site as well. And, 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 and the, the bottom line is you just got to do whatever it takes to pay the bills. 
and the gopher cleans up at the end of the day while everybody. Oh yeah, you're the last one. You're the last guy. That's right. And another question um, that came up: How is the application process for you? And any tips for and for those that are applying right now? Yeah, my 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 most important tip is be yourself. Be yourself because no one else is you, and everybody else is taken. So really, really just put on paper who you are. And sometimes that's really hard because there's something called the imposter syndrome. I don't know if you guys talk about imposter syndrome when you start moving into a professionalism. And what I say about imposter syndrome is that you just got to be yourself. Don't be an imposter. Be who you are and your value added. And so if you come from a, from a uh, low financial situation, your value added to any institution because you're frugal, you you navigated the system, you you know how to make ends meet. If you're from an African American or gay or Latino or Latinx, you're bringing something to the table because you're bringing that culture, that philosophy into that particular space. So what my my advice is that you 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 bring it as a value added to any institution or space that you're applying to whether it be college or a graduate level or even a workspace. If you're going after a job that you really want, you have to say what you're bringing to the table, what your value is to the table. Just to make a plug on April 21st, we're gonna have three deans of admission who are actually gonna walk you through the application and how they view the application. Great. They'll have some samples. So. Um, I know when Dr. Romero applied the medical school, I'm sure the application system is very different now. Um, but it's still the same thing, but it just looks different. But it's still the same process. You need to get the letters and all that good stuff. Um, I have this question. Um, I'm pretty sure when you were going through your training, uh, you were probably the only Latino in the room. And how did you address that and deal that deal with that when you were going through? that nobody yeah. else looked like you? Um, I was fortunate enough to go to a school that was very progressive, UC Davis. And we had a large uh, uh, student body of color and of sexual orientation. So I was very lucky to have that. And the reason why I actually wanted to go to that school is because of that reason. And so I, you, know, you wanna be around people that kind of like you. As a matter of fact, I still stay in touch with my roommate from medical school. He can't get rid of me. I follow his ass around. And so our families vacation together and stuff for a long time. So my advice is that you do your research and, and think about when you apply to uh, um, you know, college or graduate school is that you want to kind of think of it like a suit, like a piece of clothing. It's got to fit you right. It's got to go with everything that you already have. And it can actually move around. You can you're comfortable wearing it all the time, and that was my approach to uh, to selecting a uh, a medical school and selecting a residency program, and actually selecting that. That's been my philosophy for anything that I was applying for as well. And you also will know when you don't fit in, and that's okay. But sometimes knowing that you don't fit in is actually more valuable than knowing that you fit in because you don't want to be in a place where you're uncomfortable especially when you want to succeed. Another question is, what does a typical day uh, look like for you? Depends if I'm on call. So if I'm on call, I have, we used to have pagers, now we just have cell phones that they actually send. So it starts early in the morning around 6.30 where I look up all the labs for the patients that are on the service, which is patients that are in-house. I'm a, I'm a hospital, I'm a surgeon that actually does a lot of hospital work. And so we typically have maybe about 25 to 30 patients in-house. And I look at all the labs, then I go into the hospital and I sit with the residents because we're I'm at a training program. And then we talk about all the patients, about what we're going to do for those patients today. And then from there, I go to the ICU and round on the patients that are really sick on the ventilators and need drips and stuff. And then at that point, I go do some surgeries if there's surgeries ready to be done. 
and I'm in the hospital just in case anything comes through uh, through the emergency from a uh, small bowel obstruction, which means the small bowel is torsed or the large, to appendicitis, to gallbladders, to gunshot wounds to the chest, to really bad car uh, collisions that we have to take spl uh, spleens out, uh, to little ladies that fall down and bump their heads and get head bleeds. I'm all I'm ready for that. And that goes on from like six in the morning till around 5 p.m. And then someone else takes over. One of my partners will take over. And, I, and then I do that same thing again the next day. Another question that came up. Um, what did you wish you knew before you went to medical school? Was there like say, an initial shock? Say that again. Oh, what did you wish that you knew before you went to medical school? Oh. I thought I was going to be an engineer or an architect. Kind of like I kind of like the sciences for a while. Uh, when I was little, little, I was going. I wanted to be an astronaut, but then they said that you have to have good, uh, good eyesight, and I would. I wore some thick ass glasses, so I said that was out right off the bat. So, uh, yeah, probably engineer and architect when I was in junior college. Um, another question is, what motivated you to overcome struggles that you met uh, on your journey to becoming a surgeon? Yeah, I, I think, and this sounds uh, kind of flippant, but I don't like to to I don't like to lose. I like to win, and so I just was dedicated to just do the best I can. And I was really frustrated when I first started junior college because I didn't have the right reading level for some of the textbooks that I was in. And so I would really get frustrated because I would read paragraphs over and over again. I would just say, what are they trying to say here? And I just started reading the newspaper and Time Magazine and Newsweek to get my reading comprehension better. And, uh, and so that was the most frustrating part. So again, it goes back to even back then that I was trying to know myself, you know, know thyself. And knowing what I was not good at was very helpful to get better at and being honest with myself. You know what I mean? Not trying to hide it. I'm like I'm a, I'm a shitty, I'm a shitty reader. <laughs> I got to read more. Another. Very good and that question. is, and that is one of the best ways you could improve your MCAT and your test taking score is becoming a better reader, uh, a yeah. more proficient reader, being able to read fast and comprehend. It's not just fast, but you got to understand what you're reading or you're reading it three times. Um, and there's now there's a lot of online reading um, tutorials you could do, and most of them are free, so. Um, this next question is actually a really good one. Um, what do you recommend to women who want to go into surgery since going into surgery is still highly dominated by men? Yeah, we're changing the script here at Ventura County Medical Center. At, uh, so our surgical residency program is oh, it's about 67% women now. So here's what I say to that. Become a surgeon and lead the pack for, for females on this call. Um, the, the, the philosophy is changing drastically. As a matter of fact, this year, our women candidates are much stronger than our male candidates not by a little, by, by a lot. So I think you're seeing a big change in that particular spec, particularly in general surgery and other discipline like orthopedic surgery and cardiothoracic surgery. It's still a little bit behind, but I, I think those, those disciplines are also catching up as well. But I, I, I've noticed a dramatic difference on the uh, general surgeon candidates that are female now. Believe in yourself. That's what I say. And this is from a dad that have three daughters. To your girl dad. Now, most of our I leadership is, is women. So I could say that, um, you know, there's that comment that, you know, certain things get things done. Um, women usually do get things done better than men in, in many things. But that's just my personal opinion. Uh, another question is what 
uh, if any, what kind of research experience did you apply to medical school with? Yeah, I was fortunate enough to do uh, research at UC Irvine, and I got together with, uh, actually, there was a fantastic mentor. Uh, I would be remiss not, his name is Eloy Rodriguez, and he was a PhD. Um, he was very foundational for me to actually believe in myself because he gave me a chance to do research and then he introduced me to other researchers. So I was part of the, something called the Howard Hughes uh, Research uh, Scholarship Program at UC Irvine. And it really taught me how to be curious about science. And that I think that was really foundational for me to actually move and ask, start asking questions. Because all research is, is having a question and then forming a process and how to answer that question in a scientific manner. It really isn't more complicated than that, you know, and uh, Dr. Rodriguez was very, very instrumental in doing that. So I did research on nerve regeneration at UC Irvine and uh, using different pipettes and different solutions to help with the nerve growing on flatworms and see if we can translate that to mammalian cells for spinal cord injury or for traumatic brain injury as well. It was really, it was really fundamental at that point, uh, but I learned a lot on just scientific inquiry. And I do research now on, on trauma and also education as well. You were part of the camp program, right? I was, yes. I put that link there. There's, it's actually at every UC Yep. And I think that was started by Dr. Rodriguez. And so now every UC has one. So just have to look at, I think it's called Camp uh, California. But every UC has it. Now they do, yeah. It was really, it started off very, very uh, uh, early on. And I think Irvine and San Diego were the first to, to do it. Yep. And if you guys want to look up some more resources, there's a guy who's just a just a giant, and uh, in this stuff, his name is uh, Robert Montoya, Doctor Bob Montoya. He's MD, MPH. Uh, he's also known as Crazy Bob. He wears a Ratty Raiders uh, a hat and a Dodgers jacket, and he's super smart and very understated. So his name is Doctor Bob Montoya or AKA Crazy Bob. Another question that came up is, is it possible to finish schooling with scholarships instead of student loans? Absolutely. Yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be hungry for it though. So it means, and now it's a little bit different with the webs and websites and stuff like that and the internet, but back then it used to be pamphlets and stuff. So you just gotta, I have a couple colleagues uh, one in particular, um, she paid for most of her medical school just getting scholarships. And it was like little scholarship that she should get, like $5,000 here, $3,000 here. But it all adds up. And she paid pretty much all of her medical school with scholarships. And she was so good at writing essays. Like she had an, almost an essay for every question already. And she was prepared. Um, question. Um, so this is a question I have. Um, so you took out loans and all of these things. Did you ever struggle paying it back? Have you been homeless, not being able to afford things? Uh, um, no, as a, no, not homeless ever. But I, what I did is I took the same approach that I did with college is and medical school and residency program and fellowship. I just put, I, I, I call it ass time. I just sit my ass down and just do the, just do the work. And it's the same thing with my bills. And so I put away money and just, cause I don't like owing anybody, especially the government. So I paid that shit off as soon as possible. Um, so my, my advice to all of you guys that are going to be extremely successful once you get over this hump here and you get professional is the first thing you want to do is get a wealth advisor. Get someone that's good with money because I know that I wasn't. And some of the first things that I did is I went to get some advice on some people that are actually are wealth advisors. And you don't have to be wealthy to get an advisor. It just, they tell you what not to do. And the what not to do is buy a big ass car 
that's brand new and you can barely make the licks and you got yourself piled up with a ton of debt and you're living paycheck to paycheck. See, that's what they want you to do. That's what the banks want you to do. But don't fall into that trap. Pay that shit off. Eat top ramen for a while, you know? You know, make your own dinners for a while and just pay everything off. In the long run, it's going to pay off where you actually start making more wealth and you start investing in yourself. The way I see it is paying off your debt, paying off your loans is investing in yourself. So, yeah, it was a struggle, but you just got to have the ganas to, to make that shit happen. Um, another question that came up was, how old is too old to go to medical school? There is no age. If you have the passion for it, you should do it. I think we had a, like, I think we had a student in our class that was almost 50 back then. Back then, it was unheard of being 50, but there is no age difference. There is no age limit at all. If you have the ganas and you have the, the passion for it, go for it. Um, we had, we had a speaker last week who started med school at 47. Uh, we had another one who is 50 who started. So, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Romero, would that still be the case for surgery, though? Like, abs Well, absolutely. But surgery, the thing about surgery, it's also you need stamina and you're going to stay up a lot. And so, but I can tell you right now, I mean, some of my professors, when I was going through residency program, they were viejos and they had more energy than I did. And I was taking the elevators and those guys were taking the stairs. I'm like, oh my God, this, what, this guy's on crack. What's going on here, man? So it's really about health. And, and just remember health is wealth. And I'm going to say that again, health is wealth, you know, take care of yourself and take care of your bodies. And you guys are in it for a long run. Uh, another question was, um, I guess, what would be some of your favorite classes that you took in your uh, undergrad? I like statistics. I know that sounds weird. Um, um, that's not, that's not, I know that's not your typical answer. I really like physiology. Love chemistry. All of the chemistry, the, the general chemistry, the biochemistry and the P chem that I took. All of that stuff was really, really fun for me because it just, it was almost like another language. Um, and so I like the sciences and I'm just a weird guy about that kind of stuff. And I also like history. I like the history of things. That's uh, when I, when I said that know thyself, I learned by stories. So if I learn something by the history of it, I can remember it. Another question that came up, um, what and, advice oh, would you sorry. have? Oh, sorry. Sorry. And is the um, statistic the only math that you use now? Say that again? And statistics is the math that you use the most today, right? Uh, yeah, sometimes. But, you know, sometimes we, we talk in, in rounds and stuff, cellular stuff. So you need to know, like, a nurse equation and conductive velocity and all that stuff. So not not it's not only just biostatistics. But doing research, yeah, we have to, you know, you have to figure out how to, you know, how to figure out a student t-test or a Kaplan-Meier and all that stuff. So you need to be familiar with that if you do research. Um, the next question that came up was, what advice would you have for high school or college dropouts? So again, I think it comes down to, and I know this sounds repetitive, but I think I'm trying to make a point, is that you have to know yourself. You have you. You want to you want to know what you really like and go after it. If you want to be an artist. Go after being an artist, make yourself happy, you know, you want to feed that passion. And so even if you're a high school dropout and you like math, go sit down and audit a math class at a junior college. You don't have to even enroll. That's what I did at first. I wasn't even enrolled. I just sat down just out in the back and I was like, oh, I'm gonna listen to this. And, you know, after I kind of got the swing of it, I'm like, maybe I should just sign up for it, maybe get a grade for it. And so you have to have a natural curiosity for things. And I think that also resonates in someone that, you know, is a high school dropout. And also know your limits. Don't all of a sudden take 17 units and think you're gonna ace everything and have a full-time job and take care of your three-year-old. 
that's just not going to happen right off the bat. So it's going to, you're going to have to graduate to something like that. And it's, and it's not an event. It's a process. It's not an event. It's a process. Yeah. So this is actually one of the biggest lies that people get told. Uh, nobody's going to give you a cookie for finishing 10 classes a semester. If you have to work 20, 30 hours a week and you've got responsibilities, you have to, you know, babysit your kid brother. Um, you are, you know, you have to help mom and dad at the, at the local business that they own. Don't take more classes because that's one of the best ways to get to fail. And then it affects your confidence. It affects your transcript or, you know, so, I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but if a Dr. Romero says, mm-hmm. know yourself, mm-hmm. your predicaments are your predicaments and you can't change them. If you have to work, you have to work. So don't take, you know, seven classes and try to compete with the next guy who's maybe is more fortunate and doesn't have to work and can just go to school. So it's, it's just a reality. Yeah. And I would add to that is that that guy, I don't think is more fortunate. Because that guy that's that's that has in a different situation, I think you're more fortunate that you're working and taking care of every because that adds that adds to who you are. You're you're managing a whole lot more. You're taking on more responsibility. Your capacity to actually navigate life is increased. And so it comes down to what what defines success for each individual? And this is an important concept is that success can be all C's for someone. And I'm thinking to myself, that's freaking awesome. And success can be for somebody else, all A's. And that's awesome too. It, it really is how you define success. There's a great, um, I use it for one of my presentations. There's a, there's a little girl that's crying and she's on the first place you know, on those little things where they have the little trophy things and she's in first place and she's crying. And then there's another little girl who's in third place just going like this and she's happy. And I always like that because it's your reference point. You know what I mean? She's crying and she's getting first place, but homegirl next to her who's got third place is so happy. And it really kind of resonated with me. It's, it's what, you, what you define success to be. And, and you have to know yourself enough to not set yourself up for failure. What you want to do is you want to set yourself up for success. And if that means taking only four units for a semester or a quarter, whatever the case it is, take your four units and be happy. Do your shit for that semester or quarter and then be successful and then move on to take an eight, then eventually 12, and then get your AS or whatever the case may be, transfer to a college and start your path, your other chapter. So it's not a race. It's definitely not a race. And I know folks who've been to junior college and to college for six years, and they were med students with me. And I asked them what, what took so long. They said, because uh, I was enjoying the ride. I'm like, that's cool. That's, that's fantastic. You know? So I agree that you should just do what you think you can do and not just set yourself up for failure. Because then you have to explain a transcript to somebody. You don't want to do that. Any questions? Uh, another one is, what do you think is the biggest problem in healthcare right now? Access. Access to care, to good care. And I think uh, Obama did a fantastic job with the uh, um, Affordable Care Act. He gave an opportunity to, to level the playing field to actually just get fundamental health care, diabetes control, hypertension control, prenatal, prenatal care, uh, women's health, mammograms, colonoscopies. And one thing that I think that we still struggle with in this country and it's taboo is mental health. I think we should see mental health as diabetes. It's, it's a disease process, and we should really focus on it more than we have been. You know, everybody focuses on the sexy things, the cardiac issues or the trauma and stuff. But I think mental health is something that really is, needs to have more attention, particularly in California and in Texas. Uh, shout out to Texas for the folks that are on there from Texas. 
is that we really need to really become uh, uh, we really need to become comfortable with talking about mental health because I think for a long time it was a taboo. And I also even noticed that when I was in med school. Uh, but I think the more we talk about it, the the more we work on it. And so those those are the things that I, I think we really need is mental mental health work. And this is coming from a surgeon. Um, the next question is, um, if ever along the way did you feel lost in what direction you should take your career? Absolutely. There's oh, There was moments of doubt in a lot of things, and especially when I didn't do well or I had the oh shit moment or do I belong here because nobody else looks like me, you know, when everybody else is a little bit different and doesn't doesn't have enough, uh, not enough melanin uh, when I'm in, the, you know, in these big organizations and stuff. And so the answer to that is absolutely. And I think talking about vulnerabilities and and feeling that sense of uh, not belonging or loss is important to do that. And I think absolutely I did. And that's where I reached out to either my family or my friends or my siblings and have the, okay, redirection. And you have to kind of look at your priorities again and see what's important to you um, and redirect and basically ground yourself again and start again or take off or, or pick yourself up. Because sometimes you have to do that on your own. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, going off the mental health point, do you think there's enough training for identifying mental health issues no. uh, for our medical students? No. We do a poor job. Very poor job. Uh, so, yeah, there is a lot to be said about that. I, uh, I think it starts even before medical school. I think it should actually be talked about in colleges and in high school that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to feel that feeling of anxiousness or not belonging or depression or feeling of, uh, of uh, not wanting to be exist. I think that's important to talk about because you'd be surprised how many folks have those feelings and they think that there's, they're the only ones that feel that way. And in reality, they're, we all do that, we all feel that way. So I think the conversation starts with folks even before medical school, but I think medical school has a long way to go with addressing the problem. Other than knowing thyself, um, how did you build your confidence? Success. There's a saying that goes, you can't argue with success. You can talk shit all you want, but if you continue to be successful and just put the time in and do the right thing for the right people at the right time, that's success. And so you have a certain ethos uh, that drives you. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks call it, you know, foundation. Um, and so that's what you got to find is you got to find your compass and you got to just stick with it. And sometimes it, it's hard because the uh, the hard thing, the the right thing is usually the hard thing to do. Uh, another question is, how do you avoid burnout? I don't know. If you know, let me know, because it's it's a it's a big it's a big issue. I think burnout, and again, it goes back to know thyself. When, like this morning, as a matter of fact, I was in the morning meeting. And one of my colleagues said, man, you're grumpy today. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I am kind of grumpy. I said, I'm going to take a time out. So I, I didn't go to some of my meetings that I was supposed to go to today because I just had to get a time out. And I just need I don't need to listen to another administrator tell me what not to do and what to do. So sometimes just taking a back step and just relaxing and just, you know, yeah, I tell you what I did. I, I was looking at the Internet for a 67 Camaro with a 396, a convertible that I, I kind of want right now. And I'm trying to look for one. So I'll be honest, I did, I kind of turned off work for a while and looked for that Camaro. If you guys know of anything, 67 convertible Camaro with a 396. 
Kind of picking um, back off that question, um, your job sounds intensive yet very important, but how do you take care of yourself, like self-care tips? So I um, I live in Ventura, so that's by the water. So I learned how to, first I learned how to swim because I didn't even know how to swim for a while. I'm a city kid. And now I know how to surf, so I go surfing. Um, and, uh, and I work on, as you know, work on cars. Uh, and so those are the two things I like to do. And I like just to turn off. Just, I don't like to talk, sometimes think about medicine. So sometimes having that switch and turning it off is really important. And it's a lot harder than you guys think, by the way. When you're into something so much, it consumes you. Learning how to turn off is really an art. And I would recommend and whatever you do to see if you can actually try to get that skill set. Because health is wealth. Um, and if, if you can do that earlier on, that's good. And I think in medical school, what we did is my, I had a, 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 my roommates that we had a, like a certain schedule, like between this time and this time, we lift weights. Between this time and this time, we'd go, you know, play basketball. Between this time and this time, we call it ass time. Sit our asses down and then study. So also having a routine is very helpful. And if you can get some physical activity in there, it's great. So I, I have, I'm lucky enough that I can go surf if I want to. Long board or short board? I started as a short board, but the older and grayer you get, the longer your board gets and the less fins you have. And the heavier. And it's heavier, yeah. Sounds like you surf too. That that is the only yeah I uh, I yeah, I love surfing I tried paddle boarding but it wasn't as fun it you too stand still you you know yeah no I'm a long boarder uh, someone was asking is it necessary to have all A's to get into medical school no no nope. that's a myth so there's something called the holistic approach on candidates and it really it's that's what it is it's just not a number and what what medical schools are now looking at is the whole candidate how does that candidate bring something to the table to let to deliver excellent compassionate culturally sensitive medical care and you'd be surprised that just having really good grades is not the only formula. It's part of the formula. And I'm happy to report it's getting to be a smaller portion of the formula, finally. Because people are not going to ask you what you get in PCHEM or what you get in calculus or how'd you do in biochemistry. I don't give a shit about that. They want to know that you're nice, that you're competent, and that you're compassionate when they, when they need help at their most vulnerable state, which is when they're sick. And so the medical schools are finally getting it. It took a while, but they're getting it. This question. Yeah, we had the we had the executive vice president from University of California, the second person in command, and she um, got a D in organic chemistry. And she said that she just took the class again. But she said after that, nobody asked me for med school residency or even the current job she has, nobody asked her about that. Yeah. Um, this question, I'm glad it got asked, um, so I was gonna ask it, but have you had pre-meds that have shadowed you or any advice for pre-meds looking to shadow physicians? Oh yeah, I would, I would. So yes, we, you know, we, I'm, I'm fortunate to be part of two residency program. It's uh, the Ventura County Medical Center uh, Family Medicine Program, which is the oldest program in family medicine. It's actually ranked number one. And then I also have uh, uh, in, in involvement in the general surgery residency program right across the street at the other hospital for general surgery. And um, absolutely, I would enc en encourage it 100% because you want to know what you're getting yourself into. And you also want to see what the life is all about. Um, and making connection really is helpful uh, uh, to, to the application process just to kind of get a feel for it. For me, it was really foreign. Uh, 
the medical field and stuff. So I shadowed a shitload of people. I was chiclet. They couldn't get rid of me, man, for a while. And it's because I was just curious. I wanted to know what was up before I, you know, before I bought into this kind of stuff. So, uh, yes, 100 percent strongly encourage uh, shadowing. And there's different um, pro programs. So if you get on the website to some universities and stuff, they, they have those programs already built in. Uh, you talked about keeping an open mind uh, in medical school going into it as far as specialty goes, but were there any specialties that you knew right away were not for you? Yes. OBGYN, catching babies, scared the crap out of me, man. I was, that scared me. So I just said, that's not for me. I delivered as a medical student. I delivered some, ba I remember my first baby I delivered as a medical student. It was a Russian woman and a uh, big baby and I got scared. I'm like, okay, this is not me, I'm good. Just give me my passing grade, I'll, go, I'll move on. So yes, uh, uh, OBGYN was one of the things that, I, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I, I respect that discipline 100%, but it just wasn't for me. And internal medicine wasn't for me either. They were too many walking around and talking about antibiotics for too long that I, I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, another question that came up was any general advice as to how to how a person can protect themselves from being bullied in the operating room, for example, yeah. bullied, bullied by a surgeon or a charge nurse? Yes. So they're they're full. So it's I'm so glad you asked that question. And the reason why I think it's an important question, because the things are drastically changing now in surgery. And I'm happy to to see that change. And really what's changing is that we, we are now have the, the, the philosophy of kindness. And, it's, and, it, and it, I know it sounds flippant and it doesn't, but it, we really emphasize that everybody in the operating room is important, period, end of story. And so when I was going through med school, there was some bullying and there was a little hierarchy. And it went back to what I said that you can't argue with success. So I would be prepared to go to that operating room. I would, I would study, I would, I would call up and see what kind of surgery was happening. And I would ask the nurse, what, what's, what's, what's going on in that room? And she'd tell me, or he will tell me, and I'd go to the library and read about it and then go to the operating room. That way I'm not the dumbest guy in the room. So it's all about being prepared and really being nice to other people because you're gonna be treated the way you treat other people. And if the staff starts seeing that you're kind and you know, you're know you funny and you're relaxed and you're not all tight and stuff like that, and you're thoughtful, they're gonna start treating you that way. So just remember that you're gonna be treated the way you treat other people and lead by example. Just remember you guys are future leaders in whatever you do and lead by example. And kindness is a is a formula that will never will never let you down. I I would just tell you one thing: the people. So, for example, Dr. Romero is very high up in the food chain, but if you tend to be rude to nursing staff, ancillary staff, uh, he will hear about it, and you will not have a good day. Um, this is, I think. Um, happening a lot of places. Um, now, there's also, I think a lot of people take pimping. And can you talk a little bit about pimping versus bullying? Yeah. So pimping is actually asking questions to where we see where the candidate or the medical student or the resident or the fellow doesn't know anymore. We, we gauge the knowledge base and the depth. And so it's, it's um, the term pimping is a very old school term. Now it's known as the Socratic method, which is questioning someone to see their critical thinking, he, she, or there, the, the critical thinking and how they figure out a situation. It's situation awareness. And I do a lot of that Socratic method because I think people learn really well that way. And also I'd rather them feel a little bit uncomfortable at a table instead of being very uncomfortable at three o'clock in the morning with a patient dying on them and they don't remember that stuff. So what I like to do is call PBL, problem-based learning, which it goes, goes with the Socratic method. 
is have a clinical scenario and we'll walk through it and see what the best algorithms are during that particular situation. Um, and that was term pimping before, but now it's more of a pre problem based Socratic method of going through some clinical scenarios that can help the resident or the fellow or the medical student. And I've gotten some feedback quite a bit on that particular type of style. And I have residents that are now doctors call me up and say, I remember when you gave me a hard time about this case and I just had it two nights ago when they're like, you know, somewhere else. And, and now they're, you know, full blown doctors and stuff like that. So, cause I've been doing this for a little bit for a minute here. I started in 2001 here in Ventura uh, taking call. So I, I haven't left since they haven't fired me yet. So I'm still around. And I think the unfortunate thing too is in TV shows and um, they show things that just do not happen anymore. Um, that uh, there would be a lot of people talking to you if you're acting a certain way, or if other people are acting a certain way. There's recourses that you could report people. But again, it's it's a big difference when people because you're ultimately accountable for someone's life, either you're a student resident and so and the people need to have confidence in your abilities but it's very different where i mean i i i don't watch i don't own a tv but I, when i was at work they had a episode of gray's anatomy and they had a surgeon that was throwing instruments around the or and i've never seen that and i've worked in hospitals for a few years i, I don't know do you see that dr romero Oh, yeah, back in the day when I first started, you know, but I mean, like I was saying before that that type of behavior is not tolerated anymore. Back, you know, I, I'm unfortunate enough to sit in a position where I can bring that per person in and I just start the conversation with this particular thing happened uh, on so and so date. And um, that's a no go. This is uh, we're not going to have this conversation again because this is just not tolerated in, in our walls. So there's two things here. You can change or you can practice medicine somewhere else. Zero tolerance for that. Um, it doesn't help anybody out. Everybody gets nervous in that room and no one, no one likes to work in that type of environment. That's toxic. Toxica. We, we, we don't like that kind of stuff. Another and question I is, when discovering the right specialty for you, was it the worst parts of each job that swayed you or the best parts of each job? Probably the best job, the best parts. Um, I like trauma when I was a resident. Uh, I like the ICU. I like really sick patients. I like complex problems. And so th this put everything together. And I like working on a lot of different parts of the body. And so if there's a hole in the heart or if there's a, you know, lung laceration or some vessels need to be fixed you know my I'm, i was fortunate enough to actually uh have that training to to take care of those problems acutely the next question is did you ever feel uncomfortable nervous or scared about surgery was starting out oh absolutely yeah <laughs> Yeah, because, uh, you know, you're brand new and stuff and you're like, all of a sudden you're the boss. I remember when I first started, I kept on, you know, referring to myself as the fellow or I'm the third year resident or, and they're looking at me like, um, no, sir, you're, you're the attending today. I'm like, oh shit, I am the attending. So absolutely there was there. And even to this day, you get nervous and I, I don't want to lose that because, you know, you want to be at your, at your top. So absolutely. I was nervous quite a bit when I first started. And I'm still nervous now, especially with pediatric trauma and stuff like that. You know what I like about pediatric trauma? Nothing. I don't like anything about it. It scares the crap out of me. And I say that to my residents and stuff like that. And it's and it's okay to be honest about things too. So I'll, I'll tell the residents. And I've been doing this for a long time. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. This is, this is hard or holy shit, you know. Let's, let's hang on here. This this could be bumpy, that kind of stuff. So I think communicating your feelings and being and being honest with things is really important. Uh, the next question is: What aspects about the business side of medicine did you find surprising or frustrating? 
insurance insurance uh, companies. Uh, it, it's it's really it's a really complex system, the way they do things, um, and it's a little bit disappointing. I don't have a business background, and so it was really disappointing in how the insurance companies work, good, bad, or what, however you want to put it. But it, it's a very complex system that I think is meant to be complex to confuse a lot of folks. And I'm hoping with the um, the new administration that we can get some control about it so we can give excellent uh, health care to everybody that needs it. But that's what I was disappointed with is the insurance companies and their interactions with uh, uh, with the health care providers and hospitals. The next question is, um, what can you do as a pre-med now to be a better surgeon? Surgeon? Better surgeon? Oh. Well, if you know that's your passion and you want to put people together and you want to be in the operating room and stuff, um, learn the craft. Start reading about surgery. Learn how to tie a knot. Um, what I did is because I use both hands when I operate. So my my favorite favorite saying is that I operate badly with both hands. Is that you want to start using your left hand and start doing things with your left hand. And if you're left-handed, start doing things with your right hand and start getting fluent with both hands and also learn the pathophysiology of the of pathology of surgery. Um, if you really, if that's your passion, you know, get into it. What do you think is a beneficial subject that could or should be added to the med school curriculum that isn't there now? Excellent. Uh, finances, medical finances, and coding, you know, how to code, how to how to figure out what you need to actually bill for because it's the insurance company will just take you for a ride. So medical finances and coding is really important um, and how to run an office if you're in private practice, because all of a sudden you got, you know, got a ton of experience with science and stuff. And all of a sudden you're put to the wolves and trying to run a business. So I think a lot of surgeons are really bad business people. So I think that, those are, that would be helpful. Uh, for financial health. Um, and then I'm going to go back and reemphasize the mental health part of it, not only for yourself, for the physicians, uh, for self-care, but also for mental health and how to diagnose it and navigate it. Um, someone asked, um, what is the average grade to get into medical school? It really depends. So that's a, that's a, it really kind of depends on the medical school. Um, and so you, you have to do the research at that, at that particular point. I know some medical students, medical schools that uh, uh, pick uh, residents or medical students that have a C plus average, but they have something in their applications that makes them special. They bring something to the table that the admissions committee says, oh shit, that's fantastic. Let's give this person an interview or let's read their personal statement. And all of a sudden they're I'm like, holy shit, I want this person in our, in our medical school. And it's really presenting yourself, your best self and what you bring to the table. And uh, so I, I think everybody has a story and a lot of people would love to hear it. Yeah, I just put the AMC MSTAR link and you can basically go and it's updated every year for every medical school, what's there mean GPA, average GPA, top GPA, bottom, MCAT, all everything is broken down by like, you know, 50 different things. And you could, and you could also, that has a search feature, filter feature, and so you could do all that. Another question is, uh, did you take a gap year before applying to med school? And what are some of the most productive ways people could or should use their gap year? Yeah, so I did a, I, I applied to medical school and I got into two out of state schools and I decided to try again. So I did what's called a post baccalaureate program, post back program. And it was fantastic because it taught me how to study better. I took the MCAT again and did much better as well. And I had someone help me with my personal statement because my first personal statement really sucked ass. I'm like, holy shit. Um, and then I had someone actually help me with my second personal statement. And this person just kind of interviewed me and just said, this is what you should do. 
you should just write it this way. Tell your story. And my second um, personal statement was just much more cohesive. And it was me. It wasn't the first one was me, but it wasn't really very well done. The second one, 2.0, was just much more refined, much more clear, better syntax. And, and, and it is important to know that I wasn't a very good writer because, you know, I didn't have a high school diploma and stuff like that. So, and knowing your weakness, again, know thyself. So I asked for help, someone to actually help me with a, a personal statement and essay. And, it, and I think it really helped uh, me present myself in a better way. Another question um, that came up was, if you could do one thing differently as a pre-med or as a medical student, what would it be? Not take so many courses right up front. Because I struggled. And it was like, it, it was it was hurtful. I mean, all of a sudden, I'm like tired, drinking coffee, going to work, trying to get cramming in for, I'm like, this, this sucks, man. I don't know. I didn't sign up for this shit. And so pacing myself was I should have done that better in the beginning, pacing myself. Another question is how much collaboration between different departments of medicine is there in managing a single case? It's managing what kind of case? Just a single patient, like how so much collaboration? Really is there? good organizations, really well, high performing organizations have what we call a multidisciplinary approach to patient care. And those are really high functioning places. So you have everybody involved in that particular care. Folks, um, other institutions that are not as good and have opportunity to improve will have maybe a single team or one person taking care of that person, that patient. And I think that's, that's okay. But if you want a high functioning, you want a multidisciplinary approach on things, so the more the better because you're getting better care um, if if it's needed you know if it's a simple appendectomy and stuff like that and the patient's going home the same the next day you still need a team you need a discharge planner you need great nursing you need a respiratory tech you need an or team yada 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 but for like real complex icu patients you, should, you need everybody on board all hands on deck to give that patient excellent care and there's no shame in the game of asking for help. As a matter of fact, I think those smart doctors are the ones that ask for help. Um, and the question that came in was, if you went through med school over again, would you still choose the specialty you are in now? I think so. Actually, my one of my friends asked me that. They said, if you won the lottery, like right now, to now, to now, would you do the same thing? I said, Hell yeah, I'd do the same thing, but with more of an attitude. So yeah, I would do exactly the same thing. I really had a, I was really fortunate and lucky that I had a fantastic time in medical school. I met some really good people. I met some wonderful physicians, wonderful mentors, uh, highs and lows, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything different. Uh, another question is, how has technology changed your field since you began practicing? I think there's, uh, it's, uh, information is readily available now, very quickly, very, very quickly. And before you have to study or you have to index cards, or we used to have these books in our pockets um, that we can do recalls on in our, in, our, in our coat pockets. Our coat would be just heavy with books and stuff like that like little books, manuals and stuff. Now these days, it's, it's all on your iPhone. I mean, you can look anything up there, but that also can give you misinformation as well. So it's, it's very quick information that you, is readily available. You just have to make sure you know your sources. I will say that artificial intelligence is gonna be a game changer in medicine. Most people are scared of it. I think I, I think it's a great thing. I embrace it. We just have to know how to use it correctly. So AI is here to stay, and I think it's going to make a big impact in medicine in the future. Um, another question that 
came up was what what do you um, what is important to ask a surgery resident candidate? Say it again. I'm sorry, I couldn't well, hear you. Um, what is important to ask a surgery um, surgery resident candidate? Yeah, I, I, I think when we're looking for a candidate, we're looking for integrity. For someone that can say, I made a mistake and they own it. Or they can say, I don't know this and they own it. And I think uh, accountability and emotional intelligence is really important, not only for a surgical resident, but for anybody that's going into the medical field. I think honesty and just being you know, transparent and we're gonna all make mistakes and owning it and asking for help or being comfortable being vulnerable. Being comfortable in the vulnerability is also kind of an important thing these days because that's how you grow. Another question is, what is something you wish the public understood more about the medical profession compared to what they just see in the media? Yeah, I think there's a there's uh, I think we need to do a better job about vicarious trauma, which means the trauma to the physician when he or she has a really bad case. To be empathetic to the people that are giving care, and that goes not only for physicians, but I mean to more importantly to nurses, respiratory techs, phlebotomists, anybody that's on the team because they take that home with, and we need to be kind to those folks that are actually also giving care. And they also feel the pain about losing somebody or about uh, having a bad outcome or a complications. That, those things happen. Um, and I think um, having the public understand that physicians also need empathy and uh, nurses need empathy and the whole healthcare team needs empathy as well. We can do a better job. Um, another question that came up was, have there been any changes in the surgery resident schedule? Yes. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a famous case. I think it's called the Bell case, B-E-L-L. -L. Someone can quote me on that or Google it. It's a um, uh, work hour violation. I think it was in New York. So it used to be that you had no work hour restrictions, and now there's an 80-hour work restriction on getting the job done. You can't work more than X amount of hours. And uh, I, think it, it, I think it made an impact on, the, on, patient, on, on residents' health and mental, mental health as well. They're not as tired. Um, so I think there, are, there have been some changes and I think most of them have been good. Yeah, it's called the Libby Zion case. The Zion case, right. Another question is, what is an exciting goal or milestone you hope to achieve before your career is over? Oh, that's a great question. Was that yours, Trinity? Because that's a higher level question, by the way. Uh, yeah, like, is there a particular policy you'd like to see implemented that you would do? Or is there a particular thing you'd like the public to take more seriously that would make them potentially end up in your care less or anything like that? You know, I got to tell you that being uh, the residency director was not on my bucket list. I kind of fell into it. My my goal was to actually uh, just be be uh, be part of developing a trauma center, which we did here in the county. So I think the end game for me would be to actually establish a well-run, successful residency program that perpetuates really good care and has diverse residency faculty and residency uh, 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 complement, and it self-perpetuates, meaning that I don't have to be the boss anymore of it, and I can walk away, and it just, it just self-perpetuates. That would be my goal. In other words, have someone else do the shit, not me anymore. <laughs> so, does somebody come and replace you? Yes. Please, someone, anybody, one of you guys. I would love to hire one of you guys when you guys are ready for it. And that's what I'm hoping that would happen. I mean, Ventura is a nice place to live. I mean, for all the places you could live, Ventura is. Uh... Oh, yeah, no, I, I definitely, I definitely have scored on this one. Yep. 
Does anybody have any other questions? This is your time before Dr. Romero leaves, breaks away to the next thing. Um, I had one. Um, do you think it's too impersonal to ask for a letter of recommendation through an email? Like for an old professor you haven't had for a while? Yeah, so here's my recommendation. So I, I have a policy about uh, letters of recommendations is that if I can't write a wonderful one and be personal, I let the, the person know that. I would, I'm really honest. I'm to say, you know, I, I would love to do that, but I don't, I don't think I can give you what you deserve that you want out of a letter. So before you do that, or anybody here on does that, I would strongly recommend to have a phone conversation with that professor. And more importantly, if you can't meet them in person or her in person or them in person, that you do at least a Zoom. Um, it really is uncomfortable, uh, especially for new professors. Um, they usually wanna do the right thing for the student and they'll write a lukewarm letter for you. And I can tell you that's worse than a bad letter. A lukewarm, when I read a lukewarm letter, I'm like, ugh, that's a bummer. And that's a, that's a negative more than anything else, to be quite honest. And I sometimes call reference letters and say, can you tell me more about the candidate? I do that with the residents. And if they, if the, um, Letter writers having a hard time with that, you know that that's a that's a red flag for me. I and think you know, them, just remember that letters of recommendation does don't not always have to be from a professor and stuff like that. I've had some of the best letters of recommendation from teachers, school teachers, priests, uh, people that they actually work with, old bosses. Scout, I had a letter from a scoutmaster from a Boy Scout thing. So it doesn't have to be an academic letter because it's a character reference. The person that writes that particular letter doesn't have to have a bunch of letters behind his or her or their names like an alphabet. It's just someone that can actually speak to your character and who you are, your persona, and paint a picture of what you really are. That's what we're looking for in the letter reference. It doesn't have to be from the you know, some CEO or some professor. It could be it could be from someone that really knows you. It could be from an old boss. One of the most important things is if you haven't talked to that person within, you know, a year, it's really hard. I mean, I think the best thing is about building that relationship and keeping in touch with that person through email, text. I mean, we have Zoom, FaceTime, all of these tools. Even if you move away, just keeping in touch with them if you think that person is going to be having that relationship because it's just really hard, like, coming back after three years and saying, hey, can you, it's like, I don't know what you've done this last three years. You could have been, I don't know, you could have been an ax murderer, and I don't know, you know? And, and, and that's a great point. What I would recommend, too, now that this era of COVID is kind of relaxing a little bit, and you can actually go out and do the human thing and just have a lunch or a cup of coffee or have a conversation with someone and have that that one to one uh, uh, you know meeting with someone really speaks a lot. And I, if, if it's that important that you need a letter of reference, you should just try to make that connection with that person once again and reintroduce yourself. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, another question I had was, are there any policies you wish you could implement that would lead to a more preventative approach to medicine that the public or the government is just not ready to hear yet? Great question. Big, big question. Um, and so I think there is there's a need for. It's called it's called population health. And taking a population, you know, in my case, I have an affinity for the Latino population, and looking at that population as an entity. What do we need to help this population out? And then really doing what we call a gap analysis or a SWOT analysis 
on seeing what can be the most impactful um, at the best uh, pace. And I'll give you a, for instance, like childhood obesity is one thing. Uh, uh, prenatal care is another thing. And looking at that and doing a needs assessment per population, I think that would be great to approach it that way. Right now it's patient episodic, but if we take take a whole population and look at that and help them out in that particular more, uh, not in a granular level, but more of on a global level, I think it would be very much impactful. We won't see a lot of the response very quickly, but I think overall it's going to make a great response for a healthier community. All righty. Um, I think everybody has asked all their questions.